Uh, I'd now like to introduce you to our first speaker, uh, Dr. Susan Mandley. Uh, I won't bring her full bio from the program, but you have, everybody should have a program. But Susan has been a great friend to us over the years. Uh, we, we don't pretend to be academics and to have a full understanding of Mariah Edgeworth, I think, uh, you want to be personally, I think you'd want to be a bit of a genius to, to have a full understanding. So that we don't pretend that we know everything about her, but there are people out there uh, that have spent their life researching uh, the work of the Edgeworths. And Susan Manley is one of those. She's a reader in English at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. Uh, Susan's research interests are in, in romantic periods of Irish and English literature. She is an expert on the work of Mariah Edgeworth and has produced scholarly editions and a wide range of Edgeworth's writing, including her innovative books for children and young adults. Susan is currently, uh, I believe it's, it's in publication at the moment, uh, a new uh, autobiography of Mariah Edgeworth. And it, uh, it's, it's the first to appear in over 45 years. And I believe uh, in academic circles, and I hope in, in a wider, that, that uh, it will be anticipated uh, uh, with great interest. So I'd like now to introduce you to Susan. Thank you very much um, for um, that welcoming introduction. Um, it's a great pleasure to be back in Edgeworth Town. Um, and um, it brings to life, you know, what I'm working on, which is uh, in the life of Mariah Edgeworth. Um, and hope, hopefully the book will be finished by the end of this year and out next year. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about uh, practical education in its moment, uh, when it first appeared in 1798, which is, of course, a really important year in Irish history. Um, and really sort of placing it in that moment, in that historical context, uh, and thinking about the ways in which uh, practical education related to um, the Edgeworth's plans for national education in Ireland, um, for a national system of um, primary school education for all children in Ireland. Um, so um, practical education was a, a book that was really meant um, for the education uh, as a guide for the education of children from the wealthier classes of society and it was really based on the Edgeworth family's own educational practices. Um, but the kind of approach that was modelled in practical education, uh, the secular and progressive approach, and the emphasis that practical education places on children's inventive powers, and the importance of hope, aspiration, self-esteem and happiness as the most desirable goals of education, were also features of the Edgeworth's plans for a widely accessible national education system in Ireland in 1799, the year after practical education came out. Um, so my talk is going to focus on the relationship between these two projects. Um, and I've taken as my title, The Greatest Possible Happiness of the Whole Society. That's a quotation from the beginning of a chapter um, in Practical Education, um, where this idea of uh, the greatest possible happiness of the whole society is proposed by uh, Mariah Edgeworth as the ultimate object of all just legislation. In other words, that's what governments should be aiming to produce. Um, so uh, hold on to that idea of happiness, um, because that's a recurring yeah. idea. Um, in the educational ideas of the Edgeworths. Um, so in 1798, of course, um, w um, the year of the United Irishman uprising in Ireland, questions of bad versus good government um, were very much on the Edgeworths' mind. Um, and uh, we might say that practical education is, in essence, a theory of just government and a vision of the future society, improving, inventive, busy, freely communicative, well-governed, that the Edgeworths wanted to help create. Um, so this is uh, Richard Lovell Edgeworth uh, writing to a family friend in July 1797, um, just after uh, Mariah 
And I would probably refer to her mostly as Edgeworth. So if I say Edgeworth, I usually mean Mariah Edgeworth, and I'll say so if not. Um, uh, he's writing to the family friend, uh, the manuscript is complete, uh, and so he's talking to the friend about uh, what he thinks is distinctive about uh, this work of education. Mariah's great work, Practical Education, is just finished, and I hope that it will meet with as favourable a reception as her other works. My own judgment approves of it, as I'm certain this is not made an engine of attack against any party or any established customs. Experience has confirmed my satisfaction most of the practice which the, which the book inculcates. Richard's description here indicates how politicised the subject of education had already become by 1797. By 1798, the year that the book appeared, the political situation in Britain and Ireland was even more volatile. In Britain, the Pitt government was targeting reformers and radicals, labelling them as Jacobins, would-be murderous extremists intent on the destruction of social order. While in Ireland, the United Irish Uprising exposed progressives like the Edgeworths to equally hostile scrutiny. But practical education was recognised by more liberal contemporaries as a reformist work designed to help parents and teachers encourage children to be useful, independent, inquiring agents of positive change. As Mariah Edgeworth was preparing her thoughts on education and the tales for children in the 1790s, she was highly conscious of the social improvements that could follow on from individuals' inventive and creative endeavours promising a peaceful means of changing society for the better. One of the earliest reviews of practical education in the politically progressive English journal, The Analytical Review, praised it for precisely this future-directed focus. Education, to be perfect, should, if possible, look forward into futurity. And as the state of civil society ever alters in some degree from generation to generation, its institutors should run before the manners of the times and fashion such characters as will be wanted when the subjects of their discipline are grown up to maturity. The secularism of Edgeworthian education was perhaps the most striking element of this avant-garde manual for producing the citizens of the future. As Richard's preface to practical education asserts, the Edgeworths were keen not to propose a speculatively driven system of education so much as an experimental science, what they called it, uh, one that was founded on facts and experience. But this stance of scientific impartiality was itself a conscious attempt to transcend attachments to what the Edgeworths called any sect or party it was a politically significant choice and a risky one. The timing of the Edgeworth's intervention into the debates about education implicated them immediately in a culture war, a war of ideas between those who continue to argue for social and political change and anti-reformists. The absence of any discussion of religious instruction or indeed any mention of the existence of a Christian God in practical education certainly shocked and alarmed some of its early readers. The Edgeworths, however, were firmly convinced that the, and that the secularism of the book was necessary to make the Edgeworthian adherence to anti-sectarianism and non-partisanship clear. They hoped that children educated according to their practical and scientific approach would be able to, as they put it, think for themselves. Looking back in 1820, when um, she's completing the autobiography that Richard Lovell Edgeworth began, uh, he died before it was complete, so he asked her to, to carry on writing it. So um, she, she did that and published that as, as his memoir. Uh, and when she was looking back at the practices that fed into practical education, Edgeworth emphasises her father's unorthodox educational methods. He would sit quietly while a child was thinking of the answer to a question without interrupting or suffering it to be interrupted and would let the pupil touch and quit the point repeatedly 
And without a leading observation or exclamation, he would wait till the steps of reasoning and invention were gone through and were converted into certainties. Um, so you can see there in that kind of description of the method that there's a there's a lot of emphasis on children's autonomy of mind, on allowing them to think for themselves without being interrupted. So really kind of training them to, to think for themselves. And in this way, Edgeworth explains, the child's mind became secure, not only of the point in question, but steady in the confidence of its future powers. <laughs> And adults also to gain from these interactions, she explains. If Richard was building or carrying on experiments or work of any sort, he constantly explained to his children whatever was doing or to be done, involving them in his inquiries and benefiting from their willingness to use what she calls their powers of observation, reasoning and invention. The curiosity and eagerness to experiment displayed by the children stimulated in the adults deeper reflection and further philosophical inquiries, producing a culture of invention and idea creation. And Edgeworth uses an electrical metaphor to express the galvanizing effect of this collaborative and creative culture. The animation spread through the house by connecting children with all that's going on and allowing them to join in thought or conversation with the grown up people of the, ha of the, of the family was highly useful. And thus, both sympathy and emulation excited mental exertion in the most agreeable manner. So what she's pinpointing here is the way in which that free flow of conversation and sharing of information establishes a society that prizes enlightened exchanges between its members, including those at the top of the family hierarchy alongside the most junior members. And that was a model of interdependence and reciprocal benefits that must have seemed a source of hope in 1798 if it could be disseminated more widely. And Edgeworth also explains that uh, Richards uh, was modelling for the children um, a, a kind of unhindered and unprejudiced uh, approach, uh, an, an investigation that was uh, kind of redolent of scientific impartiality, and that this approach had positive consequences for the children's happiness. In trying experiments, he always showed that he was intent upon learning the truth, not upon supporting his opinion. By the examples he set us of fairness, candour and patience, he trains the understanding to follow the best rules of philosophising. And what is of more consequence for the happiness of the individual, he taught his pupil to apply philosophy to the government of the temple. So her emphasis here on teaching children rooted an example to find happiness in this non-partisan, open-minded approach is meaningful in the context of 1797 to 98, when practical education was being brought to completion and published. In the wake of the 1798 uprising, uh, many pro-ascendancy uh, propagandists uh, made use of uh, the events of the uprising to vilify their Catholic compatriots. And uh, so the Edgeworth's attention here to unprejudiced truth-seeking rather than opinion as a founding principle of the book is really important. Another of Edgeworth's precepts in practical education is that of avoiding shaming children for their past mistakes whether intellectual or moral errors. And she emphasises that the hope and possibility of recovering esteem must always be kept alive. Those who are excluded from hope are necessarily excluded from virtue. What Edgeworth effectively does is to link an enlightened and humane system of education to the idea of genuine public as well as individual benefits. Courage, generosity, industry, perseverance, all the magic of talents, all the powers of genius, all the virtues that appear spontaneous in great minds, she explains, spring from hope.
Um, so Edge of Office is really, is really conscious uh, that this trust and truth-telling that she's really promoting as really the object of education, what, what education should produce and what the kind of methods you use in education should produce in a society and in, in a culture, um, that, that that is uh, really dependent um, on uh those in authority acting justly. And so she places a lot of emphasis in practical education um, on uh, really challenging uh, tyrannical methods of governing children and of governing nations. And she explains, uh, oppression and terror necessarily produce meanness and deceit in all climates and at all ages. And wherever fear is the governing motive in education, we must expect to find in children a propensity to dissimulation, if not confirmed habits of falsehood. So it's really uh, government that is responsible for creating this uh, this kind of atmosphere um, of trust and confidence. Uh, and that's what she's really sort of trying to produce in miniature um, it, through the system of education and practical education. So she explains that in families where sincerity has been encouraged by the voice of praise and affection, a generous freedom of conversation and countenance appears, and the young people talk to each other and to their parents without distinction or reserve, without any distinction, but such as superior esteem and respect di dictates. These are feelings totally distinct from servile fear. These feelings inspire the love of truth, the ambition to acquire and to preserve character. So um, Edgeworth's focus um, on fostering active self-confidence and active virtue, rather than what she calls crouching hypocrisy, was a recognisably political one um, in its moment. The dislike of vengeful punishment and the thoughtful and compassionate analysis of rebellion and resistance to authority that we find in practical education are echoed in the response of the Edgeworths to the uprising and to its violent suppression in 1798, as it was experienced by them in and around Edgeworth's town. It was a response that was also resistant to the predominating spirit of revenge that drove others of the Edgeworth's social rank and position. So um, thinking about all these, all these kind of questions about creating a kind of open society in which trust is possible, in which mutual trust is possible, and in which uh, those who are being governed or educated feel themselves being enabled and empowered, the Edgeworths then carried this over to the plan that they then made for national education. That's what I'm going to talk about um, in uh, the second half of this talk. So um, this was the cause, the non-sectarian future of prosperity and peace in Ireland that he desired to see. Now, before the unrest of the centralised in Ireland, there had been attempts to address the lack of a satisfactory national education system. So in 1787, a plan had been discussed in the Irish Parliament, but never implemented. In 1791, a parliamentary commission had produced a report which included some radical proposals, including removing the control of parish schools from the local Protestant minister into the hands of lay managers, both Catholic and Protestant. Again, the recommendations were not acted upon. Outside of Parliament, the need for national education was addressed in detail by leading United Irishman William Drennan in his letter to His Excellency Earl Fitzwilliam, published in 1795, when Fitzwilliam was beginning what turned out to be his short-lived occupancy of the role of Lord Lieutenant of Ireland. And here on the left, uh, we, we can see William Drennan, and I put um, Ryan Edgeworth um, on the right, um, just take a sip of water. I'm just going to explain why I, I'm, I'm bringing Drennan into this talk. So, 
So um, Drennan was um, a writer and thinker that the Edgeworths greatly admired. Uh, he was a personal friend of Richard Lovell Edgeworths. They worked together in the 1780s um, and they'd both been involved in the volunteer movement at that time to establish greater uh, independence for Ireland. Um, and both of them had been on the more aggressive wing of that movement, uh, that they both sought to see Catholic emancipation. Um, and a kind of a real sense of an inclusive Irish nation. Um, so Drennan was an important influence for the Edgeworths from, from quite an early stage of their thinking. Um, and his um, letter to Fitzwilliam is something that they read as a family when they were preparing their thoughts about national education in 1799. So in uh, at the end of January 1799, there's a letter from Richard Love Ledgeworth's uh, wife, Frances. She recently married him. He was, she was uh, his fourth wife. Um, and she writes to her father saying, um, have you read Drennan's letter to Fitzwilliam? We're, we're, we're researching uh, our plan for national education. We want, we want to read it. Uh, and we know that the book was also in the Edgeworth family, um, uh, in, in the Edgeworth family library. Um, so the catalogue that is uh, still kind of remaining, there's a fragment of it, it's not complete, it's in the National Library of Ireland. And if you look there, you see there are two works by Drennan that were on the Edgeworth shelves. So they read this book. Um, so what does the book say? Well, um, Drennan makes an argument that Fitzwilliam should be thinking beyond the castle into the country and paying sincere and early education, uh, early attention to the education of the people of Ireland. And he puts that in capital letters. So for Drennan, this is one of the most important things a government could do. He works to persuade Fitzwilliam that the deep sectarian and class divisions that created conflict and suspicion in Ireland needed to be addressed. And that education was an important means of doing this. Uh, overcoming that it, it had the potential to overcome the gulfs of misunderstanding and recrimination between powerful Protestants and the Catholic majority. So Drennan insists that truth is one and the same for all men, the multitude are not to be led by useful and ingenious falsehood, but to be trained up from infancy to maturity in the knowledge of the truth, the practice of virtue and the communication of happiness. Above all, Drennan argues that education can create a sense of national unity um, if the system were put in place that he proposes, one that would allow Catholics, Anglicans and Presbyterians their own religious practices and doctrines um, and, uh, and creating schools that did not separate children from their families as the notorious charter schools had done. Drennan makes an argument for non-denominational -denom schools capable of enabling what he calls interchange and reciprocity of mind, bringing Protestants and Catholics together. Strikingly anticipating Edgeworth's own language and practical education, Drennan argues that education should encourage aspiration. I would raise your hope, he says. I would rouse your ambition. I would shake off your national ennui and develop the, ger the germs of genius, of virtue, and of public glory. While Drennan's plan of Irish education is radical in its resistance to religious division, he has social stability in view, and his model of political change is gradual. He calls on the property classes of Ireland to hold out the torch of uh, instruction um, to the poor, to raise them to a proper elevation and guide them in the just medium between their rights and their duties. And in place of the ascendancy hostility to the potential social and political progress of Irish people, Drennan implores Fitzwilliam to abolish parties and to make a people, ending what he calls the culture of repulsion and suspicion by investing in, in education. So four years after Drennan published the letter to Fitzwilliam in 1799, the Edgeworths were also intent on finding a way forward for Ireland through national education. And their ideas about how to do this had significant elements in common with Drennan's radical reformism and patriotism. On the 8th of February 1799, in his first speech to the Irish 
House of Commons, Richard argued that through creating a national education system, there was now an opportunity to unlock what he calls the fund of goodness that he perceived in his countrymen. They should be raised up to the rank of men by informing their understanding. But Richard found his desire for national advancement and potential reconciliation thwarted by the inertia, ill will and weakness of the ascendancy dominated Irish Parliament. On the 26th of February 1799, he was invited to prepare draft legislation to enact the recommendations of his committee on national education. And he did that over the next few weeks with assistance from both Maria and his wife, Frances, who worked with him to articulate the aims of his, what he called his bill for the improvement of the education of the lower orders of people in his kingdom. Um, and if we look at uh, the rough outline that, that, that survives of this plan that they made, um, we see that, uh, that the, the handwriting shows that the bulk of the bill was actually set down on paper. Joanna has worked on this, our next speaker. Um, the, the bulk of the bill was actually written down um, by Mariah and Francis Edgeworth, showing that the whole family really was involved in this plan. Richard begins uh, the plan, um, the draft bill, by uh, stating that the first aim of the legislation would be to let Protestants and Catholics be educated together wherever their parents agree to do so. And that, that emphasis on parental consent, I think, is quite important. And he says that the children of each persuasion should be left on Sunday and out of school hours to their respective pastors as to religion. All books used in the school, he proposed, should be approved and none should be admitted that were disapproved of by either Protestant bishop or Catholic bishop or dissenting elder. And Richard explains, I am disposed to promote the happiness of all ranks and persuasions of men without any regard to religious distinctions. This attention to religious toleration and liberty of opinion as the foundation of his education system and the emphasis on the happiness of all ranks signals the democratic tendency of Richard's ideas and the extent to which he diverged from the prejudices and authoritarianism of others of his class and confessional identity. The fact that the system he was proposing was to include Protestant and Catholic children together and full consultation with Protestant, Catholic and dissenting religious leaders links the scheme with practical education, which likewise described an education in which religious instruction was excluded from the curriculum, left to the parents and their chosen ministers to arrange. Nothing, however, was done by the Irish government. And on the 2nd of April, 1799, Mariah Edgeworth wrote her aunt Charlotte about the failure of the project um, to establish schools for all. And she tells Charlotte there of her anger that the Irish Parliament had neglected to set in motion any decisive action to realise Richard's plan or to set aside any financial resources to make the education bill a reality. So I'm going to just finish here by just, uh, just saying a little bit about what, what Mariah Edgeworth did about that. Um, in the wake of this um, legislative failure, Mariah Edgeworth was moved to set down her own vision for popular Irish education on paper. And this was never published. It's a little booklet, it's about 100 pages, uh, and it has um, Mariah's uh, writing um, on the right-hand side of the page and Richard Lovell Edgeworth's comments on the left-hand side of the page. Um, you can't see uh, those comments here. Um, it, was, it was never published. Um, but it, if it had been published, I, I think that it was probably intended to be in a kind of pamphlet form and that the idea behind it uh, was to bypass legislative inertia and really go straight to the public, presenting the Edgeworthian plan for education uh, and really trying to create a groundswell of support more widely uh, in readers less prejudiced, less prejudiced than their political representatives. And just briefly to say, you know, what was in the um, essay fragment, she emphasises that she wants to create a form of education that would bring happiness to her um, fellow uh, compatriots and better social cohesion in Ireland. Um, 
So she looks in particular to what she calls the feelings of the mind. And she says, it's truly no waste of time to examine, even with minuteness, into every particular that can increase the pleasurable mental feelings of the poor. And the emphasis on, on, on mental feelings is really to do with this idea that the Edgeworths had uh, about what motivated people to do their best, to aspire um, and, to, and to make progress. Uh, and for that to kind of have a kind of ripple effect and kind of create a kind of sense of momentum in the nation as a whole. Uh, and it's really those feelings of self-esteem uh, and uh, aspiration that she believes are important, uh, that people should feel that those are being allowed for. Um, and that's what she's trying to put at the heart of this uh, proposed scheme of national education. Um, So I think just very briefly, the other thing that is important to Edgeworth in the uh, Education of the Poor booklet um, is uh, that there should be a, a kind of a, a freedom to read and to debate uh, as much as possible. Uh, and she says that really, in fact, that, that can't be something that, that can be controlled. Um, now, she knew that some people would be opposing a scheme of education for the poor, that they would see that as fermenting revolution, giving people the tools to be able to more effectively oppose government. Whereas she believes that being able to debate ideas freely, to be informed, actually creates more understanding in society, that it puts people in touch with each other in a positive way. Um, and that's what she's really saying in this quotation. I'm just really kind of just uh, paraphrasing here. So um, the Edgeworth's optimism about the positive effects of a diffusion of knowledge and information shows the conviction that she shared with her father as a modern education system and a public culture that accepted the impossibility of uh, actually coercing people uh, into uh, submission to government. Uh, that these could have transformative social and political effects. So um, the Edgeworth's educational writing really emphasises uh, that those who are governed should be granted and empowered to create um, their own happiness. And this is, above all, a hopeful vision and a vision of how to encourage a nation to feel hopeful about its future. Um, thanks very much for listening. And um, I'm, uh, I, I think there are, uh, probably, there's probably time for a few questions if, you, if you'd like. Um, or, or if not, we'll probably go on to the next speaker. Uh, not so much a question, but just a comment. Uh, obviously, very visionary over the time, but it's amazing the similarity with today. And instead of books like the in, sorry, instead of books like you're nearly talking about the internet and the knowledge that we can all get in the, uh, and then debates we have today on education or whatever. Uh, it's just amazing to think this was all going on in the uh, late 1700s. So yeah. anyway, just a comment. Yes, thank you. I think it was very forward thinking. Uh, and I think I, I often wonder what Edgeworth would have, what the Edgeworth would have made of the internet. I think they would have been quite excited by it. They might have been a bit sort of um, sort of cast down by some of the bad uses of the internet to spread misinformation. Um, so they they were really they really felt that you know actually making it sort of enabling people to read and to think and to debate was a really positive move. So you know some of, some of the kind of uh, things that the internet is used to do would have made them uh, sort of uh, rather sad, I think. But also I think they would have been just excited by the fact that they could. There were, there were ways of getting ideas out there that cost nothing or very little as long as you had connection. <laughs> and uh, so, and that, the, that could be a way of creating community. But I have just, for the past week, been I looked through practical education. I'm fragile trained. I did Montessori. I was very interested, yes, her, how priestly she was in all her thinking. We do not for those today, and that it's still going on. Um, but it was the big thing that got me in that book was, and I, you didn't mention it, she was constantly saying 
Don't leave your children with certain. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> I, yeah. I was uh, horrified. Yes. So what did she think of the locals yeah. who were the servants? Yes, I think she's thinking, I don't think she's thinking about her own household no, at all, because no. the, the Edgeworth family, you know, the, uh, really, the, the servants were part of the Edgeworth family yeah. in many ways. Yeah. Um, I think she's thinking more of the children of fashionable people in cities, and she's thinking about the way in which, you know, the reason behind this is she thought that, that big, without, you know, education and, and servants would generally not have been educated um that they were not in a position to be left in charge of children and to kind of influence them yeah um so um that chapter was actually a lot of contemporaries commented on it adversely as well and they revised it in the second edition yeah uh, so that kind of that that is i think one of the things that strikes modern readers yes uh, very much but it also struck contemporaries yeah. um so a lot of people wanted to take issue with that uh, and, and really they i mean godwin for instance william godwin i think uh, uh, from england um commented on that separation in households um as a kind of a really uh poisonous thing um so yeah, yeah other, other people were challenging that idea. Yeah. And they, I think they really thought it themselves. Having said that, like as a mature student going back, I was leaving my children, my youngest, and I was very aware that, you know, of the person he was staying with. Mm. So it is there, whether yeah. you like it. Yeah. And uh, so it was very, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> It's, it's really just a comment that today the Oman premieres of Ireland at second level, it's their final. And when you mentioned practical education, it, it struck me that that's a little kind of a, a cameo of what's happening now. That these young, bright second level youngsters are gathering and they've had the scope and the encouragement to be, you know, to think for themselves about yes. possibilities. Yes. So that just struck me that it's coincidental with now. It's a yes. coincidence. It's very modern. Yeah. Yeah. yeah.